Hi friends, today we do a deep dive into the topic invitation. It is one of the spiritual disciplines. We're all called to practice invitation, to ask another to come and experience the grace of God. Just as Jesus invited disciples to come and follow me, he said, we're encouraged to invite people to join us in our following of Jesus. Sometimes we refer to this practice as evangelism, but the word has taken on layers of meaning and sometimes I think they cloud the beauty of God's initiative among us. An evangelist, as translated, is a messenger of God, a bearer of good news. And we see a lot of evangelists in the Bible, throughout the Bible. And one that stands out to me is among the first in the record of Jesus' ministry. And we find in the fourth chapter of John, the story of the woman who is a Samaritan at Jacob's well. And we find that story, um, one that is just full of meaning, but I want to focus on the woman's actions following her conversation with Jesus, a conversation that Jesus had initiated with her. In John chapter 4, verse 28, we find the woman back in town and calling out to anyone who will listen, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? I hope you heard in her words that same invitation, come and see. Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb is called by name, by Jesus, who is by now raised from the dead. And he says to her, go and tell the others, that is the other disciples. And in Mark and Luke, we find that the disciples heard the news of this empty tomb and of Jesus appearing to her and yet they did not believe her. I tell you this because it's important to know that not every evangelistic mission is received well. Enthusiasm and even belief may be lacking, but Mary was sent and she was faithful to go, and with the invitation to believe, she delivered as she was asked to do. We all are asked to share the good news of God's great grace. Last year at annual conference, Reverend Greg Moore shared a tiny booklet with everyone. He, he had written this book called Good Friends, and in it he wanted to describe our call to Christian life, to become followers of Jesus. And we who have responded to Jesus' call <clears throat> to come and follow me, are now sent to fulfill the Great Commission, which we find in Matthew's Gospel, the 28th chapter, go and make disciples, and also the Great Commandment, found also in Matthew chapter 19, love your neighbor as yourself. And the way we do that, the way we live into the Great Commission and the Great Commandment is through friendship. Let me share some of the excerpts from, the, from this little booklet, um, Good Friends. And I want to tell you, I have a copy of this for every one of you. If we can ever get together face to face, I'll share it with you. Among the words that Greg shares with us, Jesus makes friendship the theater of salvation. That is, friendship is how God has chosen to save the world. We can't hear friends without hearing Jesus telling the disciples in John's gospel, I no longer call you servants, I now call you friends. Greg goes on to say, we find more about friendship in the writings of the church mothers and fathers from the early days of the church. They often called God the holy friends. Looking at the way God chose to reveal God's self as the Trinity, a relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Friendship seemed to be of divine origin. God is an eternal friendship among Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And the mystery of the incarnation is that in the person of Jesus, God has incorporated humanity into God's holy friendship. So early on, 
Christians began to see themselves as people who had been befriended by God, and by extension, they began to view friendship as their faithful response to God and the way of love. Friendship became the most basic way of life among those who followed Jesus. Through friendships, they experienced wholeness. They were made whole. And their friendships always made room for the other, not people who looked like them, thought like them, lived like them, but people who may experience very different values and traditions. In Greg's own words, before long, Christians began to practice friendship in very particular ways with all sorts of people. According to Acts chapter two, they ate together, prayed together, learned together. Friendship was our only program. Befriending others was our evangelism, our discipleship, and our worship. We ascribed worth to the way of Jesus by making friends with our neighbors and strangers and even enemies and breaking bread with them. Well, what does all of this have to do with our focus on invitation today? Friendship is a rare commodity today. It takes only a second to unfriend someone who disagrees with us. And deep loneliness was reported to be at epidemic levels even before the lockdown that we've experienced as a result of this pandemic. Divisions along political and racial and economic lines discourage us from forming friendships across those lines. We watch series on Netflix maybe and, and observe friendships that seem almost lost today. I don't know if you've seen uh, recently any of the episodes from Golden Girls or Cheers or Friends. They evoke an almost nostalgic response as we witness these friendships that would be entirely unlikely and yet find that they're people who support one another and love one another despite all their differences. Friendship occurs by invitation into a relationship. So when we consider invitation as part of our Christian discipleship, we see in the scriptures that Jesus modeled it and the early church practiced it, and it is still our tried and true model of evangelism. We call it relational evangelism. The church is alive today because friends have invited friends to come and see. Come and see Jesus. Come and see what Jesus is doing among us. An invitation may be extended to someone to come to church or to Bible study or to a special mission event. But the important thing is if it's issued from a place of authenticity or from genuine caring, then it's valued. If it's if it's not, it feels hollow and meaningless. We are tasked with making disciples and loving our neighbor. I'm not sure that we can do either one of these without attempting to do both. As Greg Moore says, the church's main mission in a world that has forgotten how to be friends is to be an embodied reminder of the friendship that we were made from that is the Trinity, and for communion. We are the ones who understand God to have befriended us in Jesus, not because we were perfect or because we think like God or act like God, but because friendship is the very nature of God. Examples of this spiritual practice of invitation are not hard to find. And by invitation into relationship with other believers, some have come to know God and to experience God's love through the community's friendship. Even in challenging times, this has been the case. Just a few examples. We've already named that in Caesar's empire, vast and hostile as it was to gatherings of people, uh, especially Christians, the Christians gathered anyway in small groups, typically in homes. And they invited others to come and to find the house at, that was marked with the sign of a fish and to join them. 
So in Acts, we have a little window into that room and we see people gathered around a table where they celebrate what God is doing in their lives and encourage one another in the faith. In the dark ages, Celtic Christianity moved through the very rugged terrain of northeastern England and into the southern region of Scotland. On one side, you have frigid waters of the North Sea. Throughout this area, brutal conditions due to poverty and war. Very, very challenging circumstances for a Christian movement. But Celtic Christianity, through St. Patrick, Brigid and others lit a fire and brought warmth and culture and learning and faith to large numbers of people. Through invitation, they came to know God and to experience God's grace. I think one of the most remarkable examples of invitation comes from 18th century England where John Wesley saw a personal need to shift his own life and spiritual practices to be more like Jesus's. Our Wesleyan heritage is linked to John Wesley and his methods of ordering relationships for spiritual growth. Wesley observed of, of himself, first of all, that he wasn't living as Jesus did in the way he related and connected with people. First of all, Jesus had an inner circle of friends those closest to him, and we can name them, Peter, James, and John. This inner circle of three were with him at his lowest moments and at his best moments in his ministry. And then Jesus had a larger circle, a group of 12 disciples who were devoted to sharing life with one another as they followed and learned from Jesus. There was a third circle of friends, even larger, and this was a group of 70 men and women committed to the mission and ministry of Jesus. They were the ones sent out to share the ministries of healing and teaching. But finally, Jesus met often with a crowd, a nameless crowd, and sometimes they were hungry, sometimes amazed, sometimes joyful, sometimes angry. They varied in size and description. But as Wesley looked at his own life, he noticed that his energy and time were, were most often devoted to crowds. His energy and time seemed to be proportionally dis distributed differently from Jesus's. So he began to reflect on how he might make a change. Jesus spent most of his time with the three in his inner circle, and then with the 12 disciples. And he gave the crowds as little energy and attention as possible. Now, I don't want to diminish the work that Jesus did, but you'll find over and over again that after he was with a crowd, he wanted to retreat to a quiet place, often with the 12 or with just the three. Wesley realized that he was spending almost all of his time with the crowd preaching and, and that in doing so, he was neglecting to nurture the friendships of depth and worth with an inner circle or even a group of 12. He began to reorder these relationships in his own life and to meet with people who would watch over one another in love. So an inner circle, a group of three, often met for prayer and to ask, how is it with your soul? They were in a, an intimate relationship with one another and allowed themselves to hold one another accountable uh, for the growth of their faith. He called this group a band. Then the group of 12 was a class, and this group was devoted to the study of scripture and to communion and worship. A group of 70 tasked with community service, like prison ministry or work in the hospital, teaching, a group known as a society. So for Wesley, the crowd was a parish, and each of the groups was uh, an opportunity for invitation, but it was clearly defined what that invitation was, was for. Even today, 
we have many who uh, have experienced the joy of invitation as a spiritual practice. Father Greg Boyle founded Homeboy Minister Industries, Homeboy Industries, in one of the roughest neighborhoods in Los Angeles about 25 years ago. And in his own words, he says he invests in people who want help leaving a gang and learning to live in and contribute to community. Father Boyle invests in people. Now, all of these former gang members have to agree to a number of disciplines in their own life. But one of the most fundamental shifts that occurs for any one of them is recognizing the, the investment, the invitation of Father Boyle, a relational ministry that introduces men and women to hope and grace through Jesus Christ is the one that he has founded. Well, how do we practice this discipline in a pandemic? I hope the examples that I've shared with you are a source of encouragement, but let's also observe a couple of other current developments. Pew Research published a study last week that shows how faith either increases or decreases in times of difficulty, like a pandemic. And what appears for is that for some, uncertainty and isolation and fear encourage faith. People long for an anchor, a source of hope from beyond the human voice or experience. Then others, on the other hand, find their faith diminished in difficult times, as if their prayers are stuck in the clouds or God has gone on vacation. They just don't feel a connection. Well, who do you know that's lonely or experiencing grief or loss or searching for new opportunities to live a better life? Who do you know that needs forgiveness <clears throat> and grace? Let me close with this. As again, I turn to the words of Reverend Moore. There are four P's of invitation four P's of invitation based on how Jesus invites us into friendship. And these are instructive for us today. Our invitations must be, first of all, prayerful. Ask God to bring to mind a person who needs to hear from you or to know of your interest and to bring your life to one, bring into your life one who needs God's grace, and spend time in prayer and fasting, trusting that God will place a name or face before you. The second P, personal. Contact that person directly and talk about what's going on in their life. Invest in people. Show that you care and are not just trying to fill a seat at an event. Show them that you want to know about them, their life, their needs. The third P, purposeful. Share the purpose of engaging with him or her at the table or in the mission of the church. And fourth, don't expect an answer immediately. Your call may be a huge surprise and may need time to marinate. It's okay. God is patient, and we can be as well. Will you join me in prayer for people who long for love and friendship? I offer you this blessing that is lifted from our liturgy at the end of the service for marriage, a blessing that's given to the entire congregation. Bear witness to the love of God in this world so that those to whom love is a stranger will find in you generous friends. God bless you.